Welcome, welcome to another episode of Keep Arizona Wild, where we're having some great discussions about uh, all things uh, wild in the state of Arizona. Uh, I'm really excited to for today's conversation. I've been out the last couple months, haven't been making too much content. Where my wife and I had a baby, uh, but got back on the horse and uh, released our video last week on uh, the last grizzly bears in Arizona. So check that one out. A fascinating story about uh, how the uh, the grizzly bear was uh, no more here in Arizona and and the, the stories of uh, the last one that was taken on Mount Escadilla in e eastern Arizona. Now, I, I will say that uh, there there are some there are potential uh, uh, other other bears that were taken later, but nonetheless, uh, there's you know it was in the it was in the 1930s when. They were kind of uh, gone from here in Arizona. So check that video out. Today, I'm really excited because we're going to be talking wolves, specifically the Mexican gray wolf. Uh, my friend Ian Weber, who's a big advocate of, of wolves. In fact, him and I met on a hunting group because of, po of some posts we had, we had made about, you know, about conservation of predators and 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 we we kind of uh, became friends in in as we were receiving so much persecution from so many of the hunters who have such uh, uh, very emotional uh, responses to when they, when you bring up the idea of reintroduction of predators. And uh, anyway, I it's 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 fascinating story, but it's really cool that Ian and I connected. Uh, it, it, we were on those on those message, you know, on those comment threads, on those posts, and then the hunting group. So, and uh, I think I got, again, I just got axed from the hunting group for posting about the grizzly bear. So, <laughs> so anyway, I, I welcome you on board, Ian. Thanks, brother, for coming on. Of course, happy to be here. Happy to do this. Um, I wanted you to. I was hoping that you could kind of start off with. Can you give us a history of of wolves here in Arizona? You know, when, when did we, when did they go away and then when did they come back? Okay. Uh, well, to start, uh, congratulations on your and your wife's baby. And, uh, I always thought that the, uh, the fact that we were in a hunting group and then ended up being advocates for conserving predators and, you know, advocating more of like a spiritual kind of hunting rather than like a gamesman sort of thing is, mm -hmm. is how we, we met and whatnot. Um, but to get to it, so uh, Mexican wolves have always been an apex predator in, you know, the American Southwest and much of Mexico. Uh, historically, and we know from archaeological evidence, um, you know, literal physical remains and whatnot, that uh, the lobo, as it's, you know, kind of called commonly, uh, once ranged from, you know, the southern rocky periphery to, you know, what is central Mexico. Um, now, their habitation pattern typically followed mountains and the, um, the foothills that go along with them. Uh, their primary prey is actually a, a species of white-tailed deer called coos white-tailed deer, and that is their primary prey item. So their uh, range typically kind of follows that, as is true with a lot of predators. So they occupied a place. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, allergy season. Sorry. I'm right um, there with you. Yeah, they occupied a place of uh, of esteem in you know local tribal folklore and even to the Aztecs who had you know gods like Holotl that were uh, or Xolotl, I think is pronun pronunciation um, that were you know iconified with you know wolf heads or association with wolves. A lot of scholarship used to think this was all dog stuff, but you know recent archaeological and anatomical evidence suggests that they were wolves or uh, lobos hybridized with you know dogs that they had to make these kind of uh, almost like sacral sacral dogs that they would keep around temples and use for sacrifices and stuff. Um, but they also, you know, up farther north with like the Apache or the, uh, the peoples of like the, what is now Pima County, you know, the Pima Indians and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They always uh, had kind of a place in their folklore as, uh, you know, coyotes like the trickster, whereas wolf is like the hunter or predator. Mm -hmm. And their folklore tends to regard wolf as, as dangerous, but not really malevolent. You know what I mean? Like almost like a force of kind of neutral chaos and that if, you know, you cross its path, it might be unfortunate, but you know, just kind of steer clear and it won't bother you. Mm -hmm. It's very much that kind of archetypical thing in their folklore. So wow. for a long time, they reigned supreme in the Southwest as one of the apex predators um, until the uh, the Colombian Spanish period and, you know, the expansion of Anglo-American settlers. Uh, as is true with a lot of North America, uh, unfortunately, 
the decline in wolf populations is intrinsically tied to the expansion of the frontier. So when the original, you know, trappers and frontiersmen and, and settlers and whatnot arrived in, you know, what is now Arizona, New Mexico, South, Southern Colorado, Western Colorado, even Utah and Nevada, it was teem teeming with wolves. There were wolves everywhere to the point that they could kind of kill them indiscriminately. Hmm. So that habitual kind of mentality and lifestyle of just, oh, if you see a wolf, kill it, because there's so many of them that they're a detriment to whatever human activity you have going on. Um, led to a lot of, you know, government programs and bounties where, you know, it's like for every dead wolf you bring in, you know, you'll get like $3 or something like that, which back then was, con you know, a lot more considerable than it sounds today. Um, but so because of that, you, ha you really had an anti-wolf culture um, where, and I remember in eighth grade when, when we read Call of the Wild in English class, uh, my teacher showed us a video of from like the 1920s or 30s of like these like wolf cullings, you know, where they literally kill dozens of them and stack their bodies in piles. And it was, you know, at the time I was, you know, young, a young man and kind of obsessed with like militarism and war and stuff. And my teacher was making fun of me because I was cringing and, and averting my gaze from, you know, these mounds of dead wolves. And she was kind of mocking me like, oh, you know, you love bloody war movies, but you can't stand looking at that. And I always felt that was kind of, maybe inappropriate in a way because there's like a difference between like human martial conflict and like just outright slaughter of an animal. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, it's always been kind of an emotional topic for me. So really the, uh, the study of wolf purging is kind of uh, an unfortunate necessity uh, for a conservationist. Um, but so really in the 1800s, there were a lot of them and, it wasn't really too much of a conflict because most of the human settlers were, again, miners, frontiersmen, like like trappers, you know, furmen. But even though they were going for furs, they would generally be after like beavers and, you know, smaller things like that. Mm -hmm. More luxurious, you know, items that would go for a lot higher price back home. But when the, the settlers that came with agriculture, you know, when people started establishing farmsteads and ranches and, you know, uh, cattle trails and stuff like that. That's when a lot of the wolf and human conflict began in earnest. And it was around the late 1800s, you know, like the Wild West period uh, and, you know, the early 20th century, you know, into the 30s, that wolf purging was really, uh, I, don't, I don't know if popular is the right word, but it was very commonplace right. to the point where uh, I have it somewhere in my notes here. But there was a, actually the, the Latin name for the Lobo, you know, uh, Canis Lupus Bailei. It comes from the name of Ber Vernon Bailey, who is an American naturalist specializing in mammalogy. Uh, and in the 1930s, he wrote that the uh, highest Lobo densities remaining at that time were in the grazing areas of the Gila National Forest. Wow. And by this time had been, you know, totally extirpated from Southern Arizona and like, you know, Sonora. Um, he estimated that there were 103 Lobos in New Mexico in 1917, but then by 1918, you know, only a year later, there were only 45 left due to the, uh, the purging and culling and whatnot. Wow. And by 1927, they were more or less extinct within New Mexico. So this was really rapid. It wasn't like a gradual erosion of wolf territory and wolf populations through settlement over decades. I mean, that is literally what took place. But these were targeted initiated like very much like in wisconsin right now they have like wolf hunts every winter which i find disgusting um there's a lot of legal battle going on with that right now but that's kind of separate from mexican wolves anyway um so they would have these like staged hunts where they'd literally call up a bunch of guys and pay them to just go kill as many wolves as they could find and that went on for much of the early 20th century to the point where uh into the 1950s the Mexican wolf largely disappeared from the Southwestern United States. Uh, and they were only really seen sporadically kind of the way the, uh, the Jaguars here are now, you know, it's like if seeing one was like, you know, seeing a blue moon, something like that. Right. Um, by the seventies, they were pretty much gone. I think the, uh, the last wild wolves to be killed in Texas, one of them was shot on December 5th, 1970. And the other one was caught in a trap on a ranch, December 28th. And that was the end of the Lobo in Texas. Wow. And here in Arizona, I guess as it pertains to us specifically, uh, sightings were sporadic until the early 70s, until they just stopped, uh, you know, indicating the wolves were either dead or had left. Um, so that's kind of unfortunate in the sense that, you know, there was time to, to do something, I feel like, but, you know, action wasn't taken appropriately. So, you know, they came very close to extinction. 
Um, Mexico actually fared a bit better because um, Mexican settlement of the north northwestern part of the country was really kind of gradual and didn't it wasn't as complete or like urbanized as, as the American settlement was, you know, there was a lot less urbanization and kind of, you know, farmsteading and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So the wolves fared a bit better, especially in the Sierra Madre uh, Occidentalis, the Western range uh, in the Northern parts of those mountains, they, they lasted a bit longer than they did here in the States uh, up until I, I'm not sure what their numbers got down to at their lowest point, probably at some point in the seventies, uh, but in 1973, President Nixon signed the Endangered Species Act into law. And then three years later, lobos uh, were put on the list in 1976. Uh, so the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services formed the Mexican Wolf Recovery Plan, which was calling for the reestablishment of at least 100 wolves into their historic range in Arizona, New Mexico, and Western Texas uh, through captive breeding programs. So did, did that answer your question? I know I just kind of incredible. Ranted, <laughs> well done, cheesy, and that was really well done. And and uh, it just kind of gives you a. It's one thing to focus on one state. You really have to focus on a whole region, and uh, you know, geez, even a whole continent. So I, I really appreciate you for breaking it down that way. It's uh, it's it's again. For all predators, it's been a rough road for the last 100, 200 years, basically, since, uh, you know, we've had we the, the westward expansion across the, of the, the continent. So, you know, it, it, these stories got to be told uh, so we can better understand our history and then also so we can pave forward, you know, a path f uh, forward to uh, as we learn the integral roles that these predators have played within the ecosystem. Could you kind of touch on, uh, talk specifically about what is the role of the wolf within the greater ecosystem? Well, the wolf is typically, and you know, the Mexican wolf is in its own ecosystem, it's an apex predator. And apex predators, for those that are unaware, are kind of more or less the law and order of ecosystems in the sense that they manage populations, both of prey and other predators, typically through competition or outright predation. Uh, and so really they act as kind of mediators and balancing um, entire ecosystems. You know, a good example of this is uh, coyotes. Uh, I personally like coyotes. I understand because I, I have a lot of family that have, you know, associations with ranching or with, you know, farming. So I understand how they can be very problematic, very costly. And also if a coyote kills, you know, your favorite sheep and stuff, it's obviously going to earn your enmity. Um, but so coyotes are, are complained about as being vermin. I think they're kind of impressive because no matter what people try to do, they keep, uh, keep coming back. Uh, Coyote America, if you've never read it, great book. Oh, um, amazing book. Oh yeah. Good. Right on. Great book. Yeah. Anyway, so the, uh, the coyote is regarded as vermin by a lot of people, but why do their numbers explode? Well, a lot of the apex predators that kept their numbers in check, bears, mountain lions, Mexican wolves, they're gone. So coyotes have kind of become an apex predator, which is really weird when you think about it, because coyotes are not very impressive. I mean, they're clever, sure, they're very adaptable, but they're not very physically imposing. They're not very, you know, they're just not apex predators as we would think of them right. for most ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And that is specifically because of the human action of removing apex predators from their station. And it'd be, it'd be I mean, equivalent of like the jackal becoming the apex predator of the African savanna, right? I mean, right, right. If there were no lions or, scavenger. you know, yeah. Um, actually, on that note, the uh, the jackal, I, I hate to diverge, no but worries, the, uh, the ancient... <laughs> The ancient Egyptian jackal uh, is actually uh, was actually the Egyptian golden wolf. Um, oh, wow. Due to archaeological and physical remains found, um, like Anubis and his brother uh, Wepwawet, if I don't know, their names are hard for me. Uh, they're both, you know, uh, they were long thought to be jackal headed, but they're actually uh, golden golden wolf, wow. you know, which is an African subspecies. Wow. Yeah, cool, cool stuff there. Yeah, um, but on, on that note, um, to go back to your other question and to kind of wax spiritual in a way, I really don't like, you know, I personally don't like it. And I regard it as kind of a, a blasphemous sort of thing for, for people to mess with ecosystems in the way that they manipulate and, and kind of 
stomp all over them to impose their own order. Now, I'm not anti-agriculture. I'm not anti, you know, human settlement. I'm not like a, a primitivist right. or something like that. I understand how basic human civilization works. But outright, like, kind of, you know, mass industrial agriculture and, and livestock stuff, that is incredibly detrimental to the environment, to the health and well-being of the animals themselves, and to, to people, really, that consume them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so, in my opinion, it's really wrong for people to, to remove an apex predator like that. So part of the zeal that I have for, you know, for wolf recovery and for, for predator recovery is kind of quasi-religious in the sense that, you know, balance has to be restored and then maintained. And, you know, for, you know, our Christian friends out there, they have, you know, passages in the Bible that say to steward the land. And unfortunately, a lot of them, as especially we encounter uh, here in the Southwest, because admittedly, and I, I don't mean to stir the pot or nothing, but a, a lot of the anti-wolf people are ruralites and ranchers that, are usually pretty um you know religious so they kind of interpret the uh, the steward the land thing as like you know it's rendered unto man to do with what we want but that's not what a steward does a steward maintains things a steward watches over things and protects them and makes sure that it's running appropriately mm -hmm. so i feel like no matter your religious background no matter your political background it is in your best interest to conserve nature and to protect nature because ultimately you're part of it and you can't escape that. So it's important to keep apex predators in their place. You know, keep the wolf, restore the wolf. And, you know, if you really, if coyote are really a vermin, then restore the balance, reintroduce the wolf, reintroduce the bear, reintroduce the mountain lion, and protect them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, uh, I, are are these predators super easy to live with? Not necessarily. You know, we get it. That's not that's not to say that it's uh, we, we're releasing Winnie the Pooh into our forest. We you know, we understand <laughs> that this is uh, some serious business, and that these creatures have predation in them. Um, and when they're hungry, they they uh, don't always make the wisest decisions. And so we you know that's that that goes without saying. Um, but can we, as, uh, can we, as a modern people, uh, you know, find the middle ground where we, we can learn to learn to live with them, overcome our fears and then use, you know, strategies, technologies to, uh, increase the, uh, likelihood of safe interactions and limit the inner, you know, limit the incidences that, will inevitably come, you know, especially when you're talking grizzly bears, uh, but potentially even with wolves, it's possible that there will be uh, interactions in the future that don't go so well for somebody's pet or for even another human. But that doesn't mean that it, is, it isn't worth still striving for a safe of, of a world that we can find, but while we still honor and, and um, the 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 species that is so in, integral to uh, the a healthy ecosystem where the whole web of life is met, because that in turn that's way better for us, and especially when you're talking about just hydrology alone. You know, keeping the water on the land. Well, that's very impactful for human settlement. And ironically enough, come to find out, these predators actually have have uh, 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 they play a role in in how that goes and uh could you know by removing all these guys off the land uh we we've only increased desertification by overgrazing and and the such so would it be nice to just not have to worry when you go in the forest sure but uh, that there is there's there's pluses and minuses on both sides of the argument and I get it. I'm, you know, I will admit I'm a, I'm a city slicker technically. So I, I, I don't know exact. I don't know what the day to day of a, what ranchers in rural Arizona and New Mexico are dealing with. You know, I get it, but I also know that there are solutions out there and I just hope that they, you know, we can strive to figure out some middle ground here. You know what I mean? And I don't know, maybe we never sure. will. And I, who knows? <laughs> Maybe this thing is just a generational thing that'll have to be like bred out of humanity. I don't, I'm not all the way sure. Well, actually, I think it'll be bred out of wolves um, be, because the problem with a lot of rewilding and rehabi uh, rehabilitation is that these are captive uh, populations reintroduced. Like um, the original seven wolves that were used, um, that were captured in Durango and Chihuahua to you know reestablish a population here in Arizona and New Mexico. 
um, you know, seven individuals is not not a very diverse population to launch, you know, an entire mm -hmm. regional apex predator. So there's had to be a lot of work with cross fostering pups to, you know, kind of encourage genetic diversity and um, to wild these wolves because the problem is and uh, I, I actually have several wolf dogs, so I, I kind of know how raising wolves go. Wow. Um, they they're very savage left to their own natures they're very food protective very territorial and that has to be overcome with a lot of training and patience and i have the scars on my hands to prove it um but they also once they are you know civilized so to speak they can never really be wild again because they're too used to you know interacting with humans so in the case of wild wolves or wolves that are raised in captivity and then released into the wild they're not afraid of people you know there's like like how when bears are used to eating out of garbage cans they become not afraid of people and so incidents rise because bears just go where people are they don't fear them at all mm -hmm. so captive born raised wolves have a kind of naivety to them where they kind of don't understand certain boundaries and certain behaviors that are problematic so they tend to get into more trouble unfortunately so the idea is with like with cross fostering it's where you take captive born pups from you know wolf litters and you put them in a wild den when they're five to ten days old and then they're raised you know wild you know more or less as if they were born and raised a wild wolf hmm. and so that really introduces more genetic diversity into the wolf population so it doesn't succumb to inbreeding and you know problems with that right um excuse me but they also um get to wild these wolves in a way that's pretty natural as far as, you know, these kind of efforts go. Um, and that is ultimately better for the wolves themselves and better for people because most domestic predation is wolves that are used to people. You know, they're not afraid to go onto a farm or ranch because people don't scare them. They're used to people. So there needs to kind of be that element of, of wilding where they're separate from us because as, as much as we might love them and, you know, whatnot, familiarity is almost kind of dangerous because it gets them into trouble. Um, and so because of that, you know, you might, you might ask about like, what are the major hurdles to wolf recovery? And surprisingly inbreeding is not one of them. You might think it would be based on the small size of the uh, original population group, mm -hmm. but unfortunately their main speed bump to recovery is uh, poaching, you know, more or less. Well, Poaching, trapping, po poison bait, uh, general, you know, quote unquote, human activity, a.k.a. killing them. Um, I mean, as you and I experienced when we met, more or less, you know, we were in a group of, you know, hunters and whatnot. And for the most part, most of them didn't seem like particularly bloodthirsty or cruel no, people. No, not at all. But when the subject of a wolf poach came up, they all start, you know, chanting, shoot, shovel, shut up, like, you know, just cover up the crime and whatnot. And, you know, you got booted for, for posting about the grizzly bear. I got booted like a year ago because <laughs> I, I, I straight up said, like, you know, hey, people that are talking about like uh, like there was some guy that literally talked about one time when he like shot a Mexican wolf and then buried it or something. And he was like, oh, and someone asked, like, are you sure it wasn't a coyote? And he said, oh, it might have been a big coyote, but I think it was a wolf. And I was like, cool, I screen capped this and I'm sending it to Fish and Wildlife because, you know, Nobody likes a rat, and I get that. But again, when it comes to conservation, especially wolves, I, I don't really mess around. I, wow. I'm deadly serious. So from from that, I got kicked out. And whatever, justified, I guess. But I don't I don't want part of people that are pro poaching. Those people are disgusting, in my opinion. Um, it just seems kind of like an excess of wanton cruelty, like killing something because they can. But mm -hmm. So unfortunately, um, because wolves are very polarizing, you know, people either love them or they hate them. Um, the main problem for them to recover is social attitudes. We have the, the, the area, I mean, a lot of Arizona and New Mexico is rural. I mean, yeah, the populations are booming, especially here in Arizona, like the Phoenix Metro and, and Tucson populations. But even here in Tucson, like um, where I live, you know, literally behind my backyard is a bunch of mesquite scrub forest where there are deer and rabbits and coyotes and stuff like that. And I don't think it could support a very large wolf population, but I think it could definitely support at least a pack. 
like uh, around the uh, the Rincon Mountains, mm-hmm. and Catalina Mountains, I definitely think it could support a pack here. I mean, I'm, I'm up in Mount Lemon all the time, and I'm always seeing deer that you know are again their primary prey item. Mm-hmm. And again, yeah, I mean, I, I go hiking with my dogs a lot. Would I have to worry about wolves being in the woods? Sure, but at the same time, it's worth it. Like my personal safety or you know ease of mind is not more important than the well-being of a species and that's something that even naturalists should remember um but i I think that you know we again we have a lot of room for them to recover uh former ranges uh like well here's the thing is there's a lot of subspecies of of gray wolf in, in north america itself and so there was the southern rocky mountain uh timber wolf that used to live in Colorado, Utah, parts of Idaho, Nevada, uh, you know, around the Grand Canyon and whatnot in northern Arizona. And those were not Mexican wolves. They were, they were different. Slight, like they were slightly smaller and kind of more adapted to mountain living, whereas Mexican wolves are a bit more similar to Great Plains wolves. They're a bit bigger and they're a bit darker in their fur color. Hmm. Um, but, I mean, not to be reductionist or non-scientific, but a wolf is a wolf. If a Southern Rocky Mountain timber wolf can you know, live in Utah or Colorado, I don't see why a lobo couldn't. And a lot of scientists don't see why a lobo couldn't, which is why, and unfortunately, I don't know a lot of the specifics about it, uh, aside the, from that my sister voted for it. But Colorado has uh, you know, recently passed wolf reintroduction. And most of that is because of the, um, the northern timber wolves that are coming in from you know, Wyoming that are migrating into the northwestern part of the state. But I think it would be prudent to expand, you know, the Mexican wolf recovery area because it, it's currently expanding into West Texas. Like some wolves are being moved or talked about being moved into you know, near the El Paso area hmm. to, you know, encourage population growth there. But, you know, Arizona and New Mexico, pretty much in entirety, most of Utah, I mean, most of Colorado, Western Texas. I don't see a reason why the, the Lobo couldn't repopulate all these areas. You know, it would be great for the species and help its recovery immensely. Yeah, that'd be beautiful. Can you uh, can you kind of give an overview of the the gray wolf reintroduction here in the southwest? And you know, how sure. did that take place? You know, we've, we've kind of alluded to it, but uh, maybe give the specifics for anyone who doesn't know. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so between 1977 and 1980, you know, this is after um, the the Nixon uh, Endangered Species Act. Uh, four males and a female from, again, Durango and Chihuahua were taken and started here in Arizona and New Mexico to be a new pack. And throughout the 80s, there was a lot of legislative stuff and, you know, kind of establishment population breeding going on in in very controlled environments. Uh, But so by 1993, with the addition of new lineages from, you know, different wolves from around the former range of it, um, the captive population was 178. So this was, you know, seen as enough to start rewilding them after, you know, years of work and patience. So with that captive population, they were released into Apache National Forest uh, in eastern Arizona. Uh, and the whole goal with that was that they would spread f- through the mountain range. Like I talked about, they, they follow their prey over foothills and mountains, more or less. Uh, so the idea was that from those, uh, the White Mountains, they would kind of spread throughout you know southwest new mexico and eastern arizona and ultimately kind of start to recolonize both states in entirety so but wolf reintroduction or lobo reintroduction really began in earnest in 1998 uh 13 mexican wolves in total first it was 11 and then two more were released later Uh, all of them were raised in captivity but they were released into the white mountains um, and since then they they've been using helicopters and gps collars and all that fancy technology um so that fish and game agents and, and workers can track and monitor lobos in the wild and, you know, watch their recovery and, and stuff like that. So to all those would be poachers out there, uh, just keep in mind that if you kill one, they're going to know about it. And yeah, I hope you get caught anyway. Um, <laughs> or, you know, you a ba- or a bear eats your face before they even get that far, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so since then, you know, the late nineties, they've been, slowly growing um unfortunately in the beginning a lot of them had to be removed from the wild and put back in captivity because again captive born wolves can be problematic you know they were uh 
predating on a lot of uh, livestock and stuff like that. And because the program was so infantile and in it's, and it's, you know, age, they didn't want to make it unpopular before it really got its legs up. So they removed those problematic wolves. Um, but ultimately the pro the program has been really successful uh, going into the two thousands. It kept growing and growing even under the uh, fairly anti-environmental, you know, Bush administration years, their population was still growing to the point where, you know, by the Obama administration and, and whatnot, they were not flourishing maybe, but the, their population growth was stealthy and the, or stealthy, uh, steadily growing and maintained for, for years. Uh, the criteria for them to be taken off the endangered species list is I think 300 wolves in the U S between Arizona and New Mexico and 200 in Mexico but consistently for eight years. It has to be at least that much for eight years before they can be removed from the endangered species list. Uh, and that was at the end, that was the uh, end result of a 2017 revision of a 1982 recovery plan. So, I mean, in, let's see, uh, for the most part, yeah, there, aside from human poaching and, and trapping and stuff like that, there really haven't been any major problems uh, social attitudes are the primary hurdle again. By late 2012, there were 75 wolves and four breeding pairs living in the allotted recovery areas here in Arizona. 27% of the population was pups, which indicated they were breeding and breeding a lot, which is good. Uh, and since 1998, 98 Lobo deaths, you know, Mexican wolves have been recorded, four of which happened in 2012. And unfortunately, all of these were due to again, quote unquote, human activity, you know, shooting, baiting, uh, trapping, all that sort of thing. Hmm. But uh, a study in 2015 in February by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife showed that there was a minimum population in Arizona and New Mexico of 109 wolves, which was a 31% increase from the 83 counted in 2014. And then a later survey, uh, survey of the population done in Alpine, Arizona, found that the recovery of the species was only hampered by poaching, and so, I mean, it's pretty grounded in the scientific data that the only obstacle for their recovery is poaching, is quote unquote human activity. And in 2016, 14 of them had been killed, which was the high, single highest year of, you know, Mexican wolf deaths since they were reintroduced in 1998. Two of the deaths, unfortunately, were when U.S. Fish and Wildlife officials were trying to collar them because, you know, they can struggle pretty, pretty hard. But uh, the rest, again, due to poaching. Aside from those incidences, though, and a few more that happened recently that, you know, you and I kind of have already like seen, you mm -hmm. know, in our own experience. Um, aside from that, their population, you know, I've got a list of st statistics here, excuse me, that I could keep going over. But the general idea is that their population is growing by almost double digit percentiles every year. Um, another example, as of July 2017, 31 wild wolves inhabited Chihuahua and Sonora in the northern mountains. The 114 within Arizona and New Mexico were in 22 packs, and all of them had a 24, per, at least a 24 percent increase from an uh, annual basis of the prior year in their population. So they're growing. The only deaths are really from human poaching, and so if we can get a societal attitude that accepts wolves as an apex predator and accepts, accepts them in the area, you know, and a lot of younger people aren't used to the idea of there being wolves here. Um, I'm sure, you know, cause you, you like the, uh, the last grizzly bears in Arizona and you like the jaguars and stuff, you know, that these animals, you know, when you say, Oh yeah, there's jaguars in Arizona, people look at you funny, like, no way. What? That, that's, that's <laughs> no, that's like some know, cryptozoology. Right? It's like, no, no, no. There's literally a jaguar in the mountains 45 minutes from my house. Like it's cool. Yeah. And if we can really raise a younger generation, um, and I don't want to sound like saying indoctrinate your kids to love wolves or whatever, although maybe you could do that. Not a bad idea. Um, if we can foster really just a community, I like acceptance of wolves, you know, and I mean community in the you know, Southern Arizona, Arizona or the greater Southwest, whatever you want to go with in terms of what you consider your community. If we can have community acceptance of wolves that fosters protection of wolves and, and other large predators at that, not only will we see healthy, healthier ecosystems and more complete ecosystems, but you know, our children and grandchildren will get to grow up in an Arizona where yes, there are wolves. Yes, there are jaguars. Yes, there are bears. Like maybe you don't want to go see them, but you know, they're there. And just, just knowing that they're there, I think gives kids a lot of, 
you know, interest and in, in stuff. Like Steve Irwin once said, the reason that he teaches people about wildlife is because he wants them to save it. And so, you know, a lot of the, like the desert museums and stuff in our neck of the woods, some people consider them kind of hokey. Like who wants to go to the zoo and see bighorn sheep and a mountain lion? Like that's boring. But <laughs> as these animals increasingly disappear, you know, some, some, some great, like, you know, spirit of the West is lost. And Lobos in particular, I feel like are, are a very, like, very important symbol of kind of that, that Western sense of freedom. And, you know, I mean, I mean, admittedly, I am kind of a regionalist. I, I tend to see like uh, bioregional separations as more of a community than, you know, state boundaries and whatnot. Right. But part of what I love so much about the West, be it, you know, our deserts or, you know, the misty forests of the Northwest or the, you know, the snowy Rockies is just that, that constant, like historical sense of like freedom and, you know, being close to nature and being close to your fellow man, because these communities are typically kind of smaller and more rural and, you know, more dependent on each other, like in a healthy sort of way. And I really think that for people to have healthy environments and relationships, the environment around them needs to be healthy too. And if we can make more complete, healthy ecosystems, that'll lead to more complete, healthy communities and ultimately just more complete, healthy living for everyone and everything. That's it, man. Well said. It's a, it's like a holistic view, you know, cause you're, t you're taking in the whole and you know, again, it goes back to this. Uh, can we overcome our fears? I mean, I'm afraid of these animals just like anybody, you know, I mean, I, even though we're, I'm sure you are too, you know, you have like a healthy, healthy fear for them, you know, but it, it, or healthy respect, but you know, it's not like you were trying to jump into grizzly bear dens or anything like that. Right. I mean, my, my wolf dog has literally sent me to the hospital shattering the bones in my Jeez. hand. Like, I, yeah. I, I have a healthy respect for, for what they can do. But I wouldn't say I fear them, though, because fear really means that, you know, something bothers you or it wards you away or yeah. something. And that's, that's not true. to say that. But it's like it's more of like, you know, how sailors don't really fear the ocean. It's more that they respect its power. You know, they right. respect its ability to take life, but also give it and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that. You know, you can approach a wolf. Now, I can freely admit a grizzly bear scares the hell out of me. But with wolves, I guess maybe it's something of a totemic thing. It's like I just see them as so akin to humanity in like mm -hmm. soul and, and function that it's really hard for me to have the idea of fear by them. Yeah. I get but, it. Yeah, I understand what you mean, though. I didn't mean to derail you. No, no, no. You, you, you are right. I guess, I mean, really my statement was, how can we overcome our fear to take a step back, give these animals their respect, and then also, but, but not feel like we have to eliminate their existence in order to live, you know? That, you know, hopefully we can overcome our fears enough to to cohabitate with them so that we can get these, you know, like you were, had, as you were describing these these holistic these holistic fully healthy ecosystems which i personally again i think that when we're talking about combating climate change this reintroduction of of predators is a is a is a key strategy if you ask me so just as just as much as obviously we, we need to overhaul our agricultural systems and things like that but reintroduction of of uh of these predators is, is a is a good step in the right direction for keeping our the land itself cooler. Um, Ian, if for anyone, you know, we're gonna we'll we'll uh, wrap this up, but I want you to to end with this. Anyone who's kind of on the fence about uh, wolf, uh, greater greater wolf uh, reintroduction, um, what would you say to them? I would say. Well, for starters, almost in a heartstring kind of way, look at your dog, look in his eyes and know that that thing that loves you so much and that you love so much is ultimately akin to the very thing that you're not so certain about saving. And I'm not saying that these things are your dog. They're going to you know, be a happy, you know, wagging tail thing that'll love you. Probably not. They'll, they're a predator. But the point is, <clears throat> all things have an origin and a place in nature. And when you look at your dog, I would want you to think that your dog only exists because of something's place in nature being left undisturbed and it being let left free to to do as it will to do as it's you know going to be so for those ancestors of our dogs that were wolves that adapted to living by humans they were left to do that un unto their own course and that's how they came to be 
Uh, furthermore, <clears throat> on a non, you know, personal, emotional level, I would just point to the science. <clears throat> I would say, you know, look at the, uh, like you discussed, the effect on hydrology that these predators have. Look at the effect they have on the health of elk and deer herds by eliminating the old and the sick. I mean, all over the West, uh, wasting disease among uh, deer and whatnot is an extreme problem. And wolves and other apex predators help cull this. Um, so there's a lot of scientific backing for their reintroduction and on in like a, uh, kind of political way, I, I would almost say that, you know, these things are symbolic of the, uh, the American West, the American Southwest and our independence and our fierceness, you know, kind of like those political platitudes politicians love to spit, but that, that kind of theatrical, uh, explanation as to how emblematic they are for ourselves, because the kind of people that, that really, you know, don't just live in Arizona, but thrive here. They're, they're of a particular breed, as, as you can probably attest. They're not faint of heart type of people. They're not quitters. They're the kind of people where it's like, oh, it's 115 and, and pouring rain and I have to go do stuff. All right, better get to it. Yep. That is a spirit that is very much found in these wolves because they're persistent. They don't give up. They, you know, we, they came close to being wiped out, but they are hard to kill. And that's respectable enough, I think, to allow them to exist. Yeah, well said, brother. And I, uh, I just commend you for your passion, for your knowledge. Uh, man, that was so fascinating listening to you just go over the history. Uh, you had your facts straight. And anyway, just thank you, man. This is ultimately this is uh, just uh, the more the more just knowledge, facts that we can shed uh, out there to the public. Uh, this is this is how the the fear alleviates. This is how the the new, like a new vision of how we can cohabitate can can come forth. So just get the facts, Jack. Thank yeah. you, Ian. Uh, absolutely. If I, if I may plug a few things for people that are interested in uh, getting involved absolutely. or getting uh, Grand Canyon Wolf Recovery Project. Uh, it's run out of Flagstaff. It's promoted to the reintroduction of wolves in northern Arizona and southern Utah. Uh, great organization. Um, Colorado, uh, I think they changed their name recently, but the Colorado Wolf uh, Recovery Project, they also, a uh, good organization dedicated to, you know, reestablishing wolves in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Uh, but other than that, there's a, a lot of smaller organizations, some of which are just like, you know, mexicanwolves.org. Um, the, they all, you know, you can support them just by writing letters to your representatives. You can, you know, buy a little merchandise from their stores because that that those that money goes to, you know, funding their efforts for you know wolf recovery and whatnot. Uh, any of these organizations would love volunteers, would love support in any way you want to show it. If you care about wolves and predator reintroduction, there's a bunch of stuff you can do. Every little bit helps. And, you know, I personally appreciate every single person that cares about these animals and wants to see them restored and healthy. Absolutely. And uh, the Game and Fish released uh, uh, released a report on the Mexican gray wolves this past October, correct, Ian? Is that right? Yes, they did. Okay. Yeah, they did. I'll post the link on here. So, yeah. Definitely worth seeing. So you can see the, the growth numbers. You know, they're at like 176, I think, as of 2019. So, they're do, I guess they're they're doing the counts right now for 2020 and uh, or they had just finished them or whatnot, but anyway, it's uh it's a it's a great success story and uh, thank God there hasn't been you know major incidences and hopefully they're they're you know they're they can outpace the poaching that goes on and as as they have enough resources for themselves to live out here in the wild of Arizona New Mexico it's so awesome so thanks Ian appreciate it buddy we have to do this again for sure. Absolutely. Later, brother.